Hello there. In the long list of really awesome indie games that probably won't ever be finished anytime soon, we've got another entry to add to the ranks here with Gloomwood. Dylan Rogers throwback to immersive sims the late 90s and early 2000s where you play as a Victorian era doctor trapped in a spooky city. Going around stabbing poor defenseless axe wielding hunters in the back with a cane sword. Published by New Blood Interactive, it's just come out in early access, which means we can expect a pretty steady stream of not much happening for the next few years until the day it finally gets finished. LOL. But don't worry, because what you can play in the meantime is still pretty damn good. And despite its short length, it's still one of the most promising games that's coming out at the moment. I mean, it sure beats the hell out of Saints Row, let me put it that way. Nice. Now, Gloomwood has been described as thief with guns. In fact, I'm even guilty of calling it that myself at one point. But I do kind of think that that's almost kind of selling the whole thing short. Because while you can definitely see the influence that Looking Glass Studios, you know, masterpieces had on this thing, it's also packed with references and mechanics that feel like they've been lifted from other games as well. For instance, the main menu along with the inventory and the health system reminds me of Resident Evil's inventory management, and instead of a traditional health bar, it's now been replaced with health states like fine, caution, and danger. The game opens with you being led out of a pit by Stephen Waite doing his best father Gregor impersonation. Ah, oh, good doctor. What an unfortunate predicament you found yourself in. You've stirred up hell, <laughs> man after my own heart. Before you're then moving through these fisheries, like you've crossed over into HP Lovecraft's shadow over Innsmouth. The mysterious affliction all these hunters seem to be suffering from and their weird hive mind mentality kind of harkens back to the corrupted citizens of Innsmouth, and their desire to hunt down the player also kind of mimics some of that game's more memorable sequences. These starting areas involve sneaking around a dimly lit fishery, and about the only thing lacking here in the atmosphere and the immersion is the actual smell of rotting fish. Of course, that could easily be fixed by having your mum sit in the same room while I played. You can't keep getting away with it! Outside, you don't get any respite either, with the harsh, foreboding cliffside, and a lighthouse off in the distance that periodically lights up the surroundings, giving away your position if you're not careful. And I kind of feel too that navigating these cliffside pathways and avoiding all these enemy patrols also kind of reminded me a bit of the Highway 17 from Half-Life 2. The way there's all these old wooden structures precariously placed on the edges, looking like they could tumble over at any time and be consumed by the ocean if the breeze caught them on the right angle. You can even go in and out of these buildings through the destroyed floorboards. I mean, the whole thing's all very similar. Not to mention, your end goal is to reach a lighthouse. Again, you know, kind of similar to Half-Life 2. Finally rounded out with moving through these underground caves lit up by these glowing gems like you've hopped over into the world of Ark's Fatalis. But how you get to all of this is left entirely up to the player. You can go through the buildings, you can climb along the rooftops, you can use the physics engine to stack crates and make your very own little makeshift stairways. Steal the key from a guard or just pry it off his cold dead corpse, it's entirely up to you. So yeah, calling it Thief with Guns I guess is fine, but having played a bit more of it, I think that's definitely underselling it. Yes, again, I know that I said the same thing two years ago, but I'm trying to correct my mistakes, alright? Bitch. Gloomwood also really kind of gets away with the fact that it looks like a game that could be made back in 1999. A lot of games these days try to copy that old school aesthetic, but they don't really capture it. And I reckon if you told someone that this was made a couple of decades ago and they had no idea, well, you could probably actually convince them. There's no real music here, and instead the background ambience works in lieu of a soundtrack. In fact, it actually kind of reminds me a bit of Doom 3, where you'd enter an area and the background noise of all these different types of machinery would serve as the closest you'd get to a backing track. There's just an effortless feel to the environments, and although it is retreading some familiar ground, it still somehow finds a way to make things interesting. And the way you frequently find new routes back to these previously explored areas really encourages exploration. It's an aspect that it just really nails, which is something those older games also did really well. Another thing this game definitely shares in common with its 90s and 2000s brethren is the visual style and the audio design, focusing lots more on ambient noises and diegetic cues. Best you don't let anyone hear you say that. Yeah, don't expect this thing to melt your 3080 Ti though, and I don't think I even need to talk about the performance with this one. I mean, look, it's a 450 megabyte game, right? It's not really going to put your rig to the test. But then I guess that's also part of what makes the whole thing more accessible. You know, for people still playing on potatoes in 2022. 
Instead of a light gem, you've got the light ring worn on the Doctor's right hand with a jewel which functions exactly the same, showing how illuminated and visible you are. If this thing is lit up, well, then that means you're easier to spot than piss stains on denim jeans, but if it's dark, well, then you're practically invincible. And unless someone walks close enough that they're going to trip over you, you're pretty much never going to be seen. I think that this ring mechanic is actually like a super clever way to explain crucial information to the player without also needing to bog you down with a needless heads up display. In fact, all around I think the game's way of conveying important information is pretty much seamless. Remember a few years back when there were all those memes going around about how FPS games were becoming super cluttered and over explaining things and being bogged down with needless features? And now you've got a game like Gloomwood coming out in 2022 and it's like the polar opposite of all of those memes, doing away with that kind of heads up display almost entirely. I mean, for instance, there's not even a basic health bar, and checking what available ammo you've got left is done by either opening the chamber of the gun itself, or by popping open your inventory. Yeah, and opening your inventory doesn't magically pause the game either, meaning you can't just pull up your suitcase in the middle of combat to heal. And I think this might be the most fun inventory screen to mess around with since maybe Resident Evil 4. <laughs> Thank you. This also kind of carries over to saving your progress. You don't just mash that F5 button every 12 seconds now. Instead, you've got to find your way to fix save points. In this case, phonographs, where you can finally get some much needed respite. You'll often hear these things before you even see them. The noise they make kind of serve as a bit of a beacon, directing you closer and closer. And I gotta say that that music is downright therapeutic. I do hope in the future though that they make this like a limited feature and somehow work in ink ribbons or something similar to limit the amount of times you can save. Because as it is right now, infinite saving is really just a matter of backtracking to the nearest one of these things. And that really means that Gloomwood is just way too forgiving and really kind of easy, even on the game's so-called hard mode. One of our brothers was just killed! The AI in this thing seems to border on being completely oblivious to your presence, or so clever and fucking ruthless that they'll pursue you without fail and even hit you through solid objects. I mean, like, look at this, right? That's just a big old pile of bullshit. And then at one point, I murdered two dudes standing right next to each other, and the second guy didn't even notice when his mate had been killed. And despite the game supposedly being stealth based, which, you know, it still is, it's just far more easy and to be honest, more fun just murdering everyone you come across. From actually shooting enemies with guns to using other elements to your advantage. And I gotta say that I don't think I'll ever get sick of putting an explosive barrel between a group of guys and then shooting it, blowing them all to smithereens. I mean, shit, man, it's not my fault that someone left all these things lying around, is it? And look, when you put a flammable logo on a barrel like this, you're basically just begging for the play to shoot it. Even bear traps can be picked up and placed around here, letting these short-sighted hunters walk right into them like complete jackasses. Holy shit! They don't even break upon use, and they can be put out time and time again. You know, if you ever get sick of shooting things. Speaking of the shooting, this is about the best example of quantity over quality I think that you're ever going to see, and when it comes to the weapons and the items, it's like every single little thing you come across in the game world feels deliberate and well thought out. I mean, the Doctor's cane sword alone is more than enough to get you through the entire game, killing every enemy in a single hit if you can stab them from behind. Enemies are often just going to stand still with their backs turned to you, not even really even patrolling, just kind of staring off into the horizon, begging to be put out of their misery. But even the ones who don't, you know, who actually patrol back and forth, usually do it in a very basic manner, making getting behind them just way too easy. A subtle glint from the sword when you're charging it up lets you know it's going to be a killing blow, which, again, is another really clever way that the game expresses information without needing to throw it into the player's face. And from the hunters even through to these weird-looking dog creatures in the caves, none can resist that age-old weakness of catching a sharp object to their spine. <laughs> Then for the less subtle approaches, you've got a revolver and a shotgun. Now the revolver is pretty weak, taking two or three shots to kill basic enemies, and it seems that headshots aren't even a thing here, though that's probably for the best, because enemies would be even more trivial if you could just dome them in a single hit from a darkened corner. Ammo is common without feeling too flushed, and if you use it sparingly, well you'll probably never run out. 
can also be used to shoot out light sources to make a quick hiding spot. But I think at that point, trying to shoot out a light source to stay hidden is like trying to put out an oil fire by throwing a water balloon at it. The shotgun, which is held back until late in the demo, is actually one of the more unique looking ones, being a folding shotgun, which is something I still don't think I've ever seen any other video game use before. And like all good survival horror, shells are rare, but the gun is suitably powerful, just obliterating enemies in a single hit. Inquisitive players are also going to find the Undertaker pistol locked away in a safe somewhere, and this thing has a few neat tricks as well, being able to use multiple ammo types. Like a non-combat slug which can shoot out light sources, you know, obviously preferable to waking up the dead with the revolver. And then the other ammo type in the demo is this incendiary round, which is just so utterly broken that it's actually laughable. Honestly, the fire in this game is so broken, and it's way too easy to light one guy up and then just have him run around lighting up all his buddies so easily that it's like they've all been dipped in kerosene. And I mean, do these guys know nothing about the old stop, drop, and roll? And yeah, I get it, they scream when they're on fire like the cultists in blood do, but it's just such a ridiculously powerful and effective means of getting rid of large groups of enemies, especially for a game that really wants to make it seem like every shot counts. Fire! On fire! Yeah, did I mention before that you can get motherfuckers caught in bear traps? The one thing that it is missing here too is like a non-lethal option. I get that the people you're coming up against aren't fully human and probably a bit on the evil side when it comes to their alignments. And yeah, you can probably ghost the entire demo and avoid every single NPC if you want to. But I mean, look man, sometimes you just want to knock a bitch out. Damn, you got knocked the fuck out. They've already got the means in there if you really think about it. I mean, just let the doctor use his sword as a blunt weapon instead of a bladed one. You know, maybe hit them over the head when it's sheathed or something and knock them out the old fashioned way. As a result of this very lethal arsenal, I've kind of ended up playing this game like Dishonored, staying hidden most of the time and lurking around in the shadows, combined with those moments where I just let loose, turning enemies into giblets with a sneakily placed explosive barrel. This also means that I didn't really find it to be a very scary game either. I mean, it definitely dips its toes into horror, but most of the time it felt like it was touching my skin as opposed to, you know, getting under it. There's one point where you come across a note telling you to look behind you, and when I saw that, I had this sudden sense of dread come over me, you know, expecting there to be some horrific creature off in the distance, but then I turned around, then I just got nothing. Or there's another bit where you can hear something thumping around in an abandoned building. You know, which kind of sounds like my stomach after I've had my morning coffee. But again, you know, nothing really happened with it. <laughs> the appearance of the hunters is definitely unsettling. And moving through those caves can be kind of spooky, I guess. But this version of the game is definitely lacking that paranormal aspect that its influences pulled off so well. And I think the fact that you can kill everything so easily just removes any real threat completely. And I kind of feel like you should be really afraid of every combat encounter here. You know what I mean? Like being detected is something you should fear. Instead, it's more like a short break from sneaking around. But I think my biggest concern around Gloomwood is the time that it's taken to get finished. Now look, I don't know the first thing about game development, but I do know that making games takes time, and I get it. New Blood are good at making games, I think no one would argue that, but they're also good at making games that take their sweet fucking time in getting released. At this point, Gloomwood's been in development for well over three years. I took a look at that first demo they made like two years ago, and ever since that, the only other content we've got is this early access version, which for a first time playthrough is going to take roughly two to three hours to get through. Now, if we go off the logic of it having taken three years to get to this point, well, then that means if there's any hope of this being an eight to 10 hour long game, which, you know, would be ideal, then that means we need to wait, what, like another eight years before we can play it? Shit. Even if you went back and replayed this for a second time, though, being more thorough, which I did, it only took me like another 90 minutes to get through. Now, I do want to say, though, I don't know if that's also because I'm really used to these kind of games. I mean, I've lost count of the amount of times that I finished Deus Ex and Dishonored. And I spent so much time with the Thief games that my girlfriend back at the time thought I was cheating on her. <sighs> Either way though, after all this time and being released into early access, we still don't have all that much more than what really equates to a vertical slice. And you know what, I think at this point that 2001 Duke Nukem Forever build is probably going to be finished before Gloomwood is.
Now compare all of this to Turbo Overkill and when that came out in early access, where they released the entire first episode, which will easily take you anywhere from, you know, four to six hours to get through. Even those early access builds for Dusk and a Medieval Man, they offered hours of content and entire episodes. Now look, I know that Gloomwood ain't the same kind of game, and creating an immersive, engrossing and believable world takes a lot more effort and takes a lot more time, but you really can't deny that this thing is still quite bare bones. I'm actually kind of surprised too that they didn't let us play through that city area from that original demo. I mean, it seemed like that area was pretty polished, so to have it absent here just kind of seems odd. There's a point where you're about to enter the city sewers and I thought that this was it. But instead of that though, you're greeted with a disappointing under construction sign. I mean, oh shit, I'm sorry. Another thing too that I want to bring up, and look at this point, I'm just really nitpicking, is that I don't think that Gloomwood style lends itself to early access either. I mean, it's really one of those games that you want to play in a couple of sittings, as opposed to having content slowly dribbled out over the course of the next few years. Games like this I think are best played when you can lock yourself away for a few hours and really get engrossed, really relies on the world building and the atmosphere to keep you hooked, and playing for hours at a stretch really lends itself to becoming immersed in the whole thing. It'd be like, imagine playing Bioshock for the first time, and then after playing for a couple of hours and making it to the end of an area, you get like a thanks for playing screen and have to wait another few months for the next level. Come back when you get some money, buddy! And I kind of feel like at this point, I don't really want to touch this until the whole thing's finished. You know, so I can experience it properly, and I'd almost encourage other people to do the same. No matter. I've lost count of the amount of early access games that I've done videos on that still haven't been finished. I mean, I don't even know what's going on with Wrath these days, and the same thing goes for Harod as well. And I mean, damn dog, even Ultra Kill, which does have a lot of content at this point, is still in early access. I keep saying I'll wait until Hakita finishes it before I do another video on it, but I think at that point I'll be tending to my grandchildren by the time that actually happens. I'll be crushing down Metamucil with a wooden spoon and snorting it off the arse cheeks of a middle-aged orderly by that stage. Get my drift? I know that complaining about a really good game being short is about the weakest complaint that anyone can come up with. But then again, promoting a product that has no clear indicator of when it's ever going to see the light of day, you know, ain't very strong either. I guess my point is that if you're expecting to play this thing for 10 or 12 hours, well then don't get your hopes up. It's more like a prologue that just shows off the great things that I hope are sure to come. Should you still buy it though? Fuck yeah. Pretty obvious they've got a bunch of stuff planned here. I mean, the inventory screen shows different gear types, implying you'll be able to get different busts off equipment, which is cool. And a collecting all this loot, I'm assuming, is going to have some kind of purpose down the line. Like maybe upgrading your weapons or turning your suitcase into a humorously large container. <laughs> Thank you. You've also got GOAT voice actors like Stephen Wade and Terry Brosius returning. And that's kind of like getting De Niro and Joe Pesci back to do a Goodfellas fan film. I just hope they're somehow working Stephen Russell in there as well. And if they're not, well, then they bloody well should be. Between this and the upcoming Fallen Aces, the Imsim genre is looking like it's going to make a pretty cool comeback, or at least have some kind of brief resurgence. At this point, the only question isn't if, it's just a matter of when. Ah!